Placement in the housing is also combined with the right to any service which provides support, assistance, advice, or counseling to an individual with particular needs with a view to enabling that individual to occupy or to continue to occupy residential accommodation. The law makes explicit that though this may cost more in the short term, there's going to be an efficiency savings in not having to reprocess the high number of individuals who used to bounce on and off of the housing rolls. And additionally, families with children must be placed in housing appropriate for their entire family so the children are not separated from their parents, as happens here in many U.S. jurisdictions. To prevent homelessness, the Act restricts landlords' ability to evict tenants when rent arrears are due to a delay in the payment of public housing benefits. Landlords must also notify the local housing authority when they are considering proceeding for eviction to enable the authorities to focus resources on those threatened with eviction and allow for continuous care in the event of an eviction. This is also combined with another of other policy initiatives, like the Mortgage Rights Act, that allows for individuals in danger of foreclosure to sell their house to a nonprofit registered social landlord who can then rent the property back to its previous owner, thus preventing homelessness for the residents, allowing them to maintain their community connections, decreasing the burden on the state, and even decreasing the loss to the lender who would otherwise have to auction the property at a loss. I'm sure many people can see the potential for a similar law here in the U.S. in the context of our current foreclosure crisis. Since this law has come into effect, Scotland has actually seen a significant rise in the number of applications for housing accommodation, but rather than trying to leave these people off the rolls, the government actually perceived this increase as a success in reaching those who were previously invisible to the system. There's a concern that lies in the possibility that the increase is also due to a lack of affordable housing, and the monitoring group overseeing the implementation of the law has made this a priority area for research in the coming year. The Scottish government is also committed to actually increasing the funding for affordable housing to meet the demands of the law. So I'm not saying it's paradox. There have been reports of some local governments there shifting their burden around by paying other localities to house their homeless persons rather than building more affordable housing themselves. But at least they are housing those people rather than letting them sleep on the street. And again, this is not some crazy communist country. This is Scotland with a historical background not far from our own and a solid conservative bloc in the government. But the activists there have changed the conversation from one of housing as a commodity to one of housing as a basic human right. And they're making real strides towards ending homelessness there in real time. We can do this here. And in fact, people are already making strides on this front. Over the past 10 years, the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty has been holding regional and national forums all around the country on housing as a human right. In many of the cities where we've worked, local groups have taken these standards and begun applying them to their own issues. For example, in Minneapolis, the Law Center held a conference together with some of our international partners at the Center on Housing Rights and Eviction and local partners at St. Stephen's Human Services in 2007. There, we got Congressman Keith Ellison to give our keynote address where he said that he believed housing is a basic human right and now we're holding him accountable for that. Remember how the element of security of tenure is part of the right to housing? Well, for millions of renters who are living in buildings undergoing foreclosure, as I'm sure we all know, they don't have that protection. There are hundreds of stories of families who have been faithfully paying their rent only to come home to find that their landlord has been foreclosed on without their knowledge and that their belongings are out on the street. So we worked with Representative Ellison to introduce a bill that would guarantee the basic security of tenure to all renters in foreclosed buildings. Their leases will survive foreclosure and they'll have to be given at least 90 days notice if they were to be evicted. And actually, just last week, we got an amendment to the HERS Act with Senator Kerry to see what goes even further with some of these protections. And we're definitely looking for support for that as well. Local activists in Minneapolis have also been doing a lot of work within the community on 
better world. Um, <laughs> but the law wasn't being enforced that way, um, but really being used as an excuse to clear homeless <coughs> people of color off the street. So a coalition of groups from our training works together to integrate this human rights approach into their advocacy to repeal the law. They printed a flyer saying, you have a fundamental human right under, human, under international law. You are a human being. Your human rights you have human rights simply because you are a human being. This empowered the local homeless community, together with other flyers, it told about the myths and facts of the anti-working ordinance, including its incredibly racially discriminatory impact. And by talking in terms of human rights, they humanized the homeless population of Minneapolis, who before was all to be dismissed as less than human, less than deserving of their full human dignity. With the law center's assistance, these groups didn't confine their advocacy local level. They took their cause internationally. Just about this time, the repeal had to vote. The UN Special Rapporteur on Racism, an international expert on racial discrimination, was conducting a visit to the US. The Law Center had met with the rapporteur in Geneva, and we had briefed him on the problem of criminalization of homelessness in the US before we came. He made a stop in Chicago on his visit, and two of the advocates from St. Stephen's traveled there and gave him testimony about the working work. <coughs> And we didn't just do that, but we sent a letter to the city council letting them know that this had happened, saying, the rapporteur is here now, he knows about this law, he knows you're going to be voting on it, and you have a choice. You can either be known as a city that took positive steps to address the racially discriminatory impact of this law, or as a city council to continue it. This letter also cited language that we had obtained from the UN Human Rights Committee in 2006, that had specifically critiqued the U.S. for the history of racial discrimination it desperately made African Americans homeless, and that the government is required to take immediate steps to remedy the situation. Ultimately, that repeal effort failed by one vote, which was a lot closer than the advocates had originally expected. But because of the work that they had done in humanizing the homeless, the community was much less tolerant of this way of abuse, and so while there were hundreds of arrests before the repeal effort, in the past six months since the vote, there have only been four arrests under the law. So even though the law is still on the books, for the advocates on the ground, this still counts as a victory. These opportunities to bridge domestic and international advocacy are around us all the time. This fall, we're helping to coordinate a visit from another UN expert, the Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing. In 2010, the US will go before the UN Human Rights Council for its first review under the Universal Periodic Review Mechanism, where it's going to be reviewed for its compliance on all human rights under all treaties, even those we haven't ratified, including the right to have There are a lot of different ways for groups to engage in this process, in these processes, from doing local education about the human rights system so people are paying attention when these visits or reviews happen, to actually drafting reports to these human rights bodies and advocating for them to include specific language on the issues of local importance. You can also help us advance the national movement. The Law Center just got a House resolution introduced calling for the ratification of all the outstanding human rights treaties. And we'd love for Washington State and Oregon uh, representatives to be responsible for that. We're also working on framing our entire policy agenda in terms of human rights. So even if we pass, say, the Ellison Bill that protects the security of tenure aspect of the right, we have this framework to say that's great but you're not protecting the full scope of the right. What about affordability? Where's the funding for the National Housing Trust Fund? What about accessibility? Let's see more domestic violence shelters so women access to safe housing and protection, and so on and so forth. So you've heard about what these standards are. You've heard about people using them in real life. But maybe you're still skeptical. Maybe you're still thinking, I'm so busy doing everything else, I don't 